this is probably the most important budget in the last decade because we have spent a long time sorting out the, the public finance mess, if you like, that the last Labour government left in 2010. And now we have a chance to actually show people what we're all about. Mm. And for me, that should be around social mobility. Uh, I want to see the Treasury fundamentally reform because I think it doesn't know how to value investment in people properly. And I think that's one of the reasons why we don't really see the long-term change on the ground that, that people want to see who I talk to. A lot of people have paid a very heavy price, haven't they, in the past few years and under austerity. I mean, wages have been in a terrible state. The wage cap, public sector workers have suffered. Schools have suffered. We've lost police officers. It's, it's been a really, really rough ride. And if the, the Chancellor and particularly the Prime Minister, promise this is the end to austerity, people are going to be all eyes on the Chancellor this afternoon and say, right, where's the money for us? And I think, and I think you're right that this has been a, a really difficult period for this country as a whole. Mm. Uh, we were living beyond our means and then we had a global economic crisis that caught us, if you like, unawares. And, and that was the, the double challenge we faced. But what we now need to do is really look to the future and actually understand how we can start making some investments that fundamentally, in my view, lift people. That means around skills. It does mean around education. And, and I think the message I've got is, um, of course, it's good to have continued investment in roads and, and broadband and all of that. But it's actually the ability of people getting into the cars who are heading to work, it's the people logging on to that broadband and their ability, their potential, and whether we're really unlocking it, that will make the difference in terms of whether Britain's success, whatever happens on Brexit, actually. And until we have a Treasury that fundamentally understands how to value that investment in people, how to put some kind of a, a value on the fact that if you have a child that's excluded from school and we mm. know what their trajectory in life is likely to be, you can invest to get them on a better track. At the moment, that would never register, so I think, with the fishes in the Treasury. in schools? What I'm saying is I think Treasury needs to take decisions differently. Right. And there is no point just having this traditional binary discussion about spending more, spending less, living within our means, you know, do we now need to spend more on the NHS? What I'm saying is the way in which you take those decisions in government needs to fundamentally change so that we understand what it's delivering for the long term. So, for a, another example would be investing in early intervention so that children don't get into care, in um, preventative me mental health. At the moment, when you make that money, when you spend that money, it's mm. just seen as a cost. By Treasury. Well, what I'm saying is that it it's needs to be of, accounted for as a mm, proper investment. It's a soft that delivers investment, the return. isn't it? That doesn't exactly. actually make terribly big black and white headlines. That's the exactly. Problem, and isn't and it? if if you're a if you if you're a government as we've always had that only plans for the next five years, so mm. even the next spending mm. review will only plan for five years. How can you possibly see the returns? that a long-term investment in an individual, uh, whether in their health or in their, whether in their education, can really deliver yeah. for our economy. All of this, and all of this is fantastic, except if we crash out with no deal, <laughs> this budget means absolutely nothing at all, does well, it? Well, and it makes, it makes planning for the long-term doubly important. It also makes understanding the impact of, of any uh, hard Brexit or, or crashing out with no deal on our economy and what you do to, to cushion the economy all the more important. So what I'd like to see, and I think what many uh, communities around our country would like to see is some immediate short-term action. The issues I've just been talking about are quite long-term and yeah. people think, well, I, I hear politicians saying this every day. We need to have an immediate, urgent plan to help deliver opportunity to communities that feel they've been absolutely left behind. Mm -hmm. And as you've said, this has been a very challenging time for Britain anyway. I'd like to see some of the communities where we're already doing intensive support for education and for schools. I'd like the Treasury to be saying, what can we do to support companies and, mm. and jobs that are already we, there? We and how can we incentivise companies to bring more jobs into those areas in the immediate months and years ahead? But we heard earlier, the suggestion was that this budget is just designed to win over some Conservative MPs. It's got really nothing to do with the ordinary person. At five o'clock this evening, is the ordinary person going to look at this and go, ah, life's great, or is this uh, not about them at all? And we absolutely have to show people what we stand for. I, I think we've got into this situation where 
The Conservatives generally come into office after an economic crisis, ha crisis has happened, generally delivered by Labour, unemployment's gone up. We generally sort out the crisis, we take difficult decisions. Uh, people generally lose patience with that and they want to see the good times again that we then end up handing the keys back to Labour and it starts all over again. What I'm saying is... This is a crucial budget because we have a chance to say, yes, we have taken hard decisions, but we now need to show to the British people mm -hmm. our ambition for what we think Britain stands for. And that has to be a country we have that no is delivering equality of opportunity no to because, young people wherever they are. Because of this, the absolute shambles over the Brexit negotiations, we have no idea, do we? We have people sort of doom-mongering that a no deal would be a disaster. And we have people saying, actually, it could be absolutely fine. And until we know what's going to happen, mm. Philip Hammond is just scribbling things on pieces of paper and kind of fluttering them in front of voters and MPs. Well, like some MPs, I've been into the Treasury to look at the modelling that they've done on these different scenarios. Mm -hmm. I think we do have a sense of the alternative paths, if you like, that Britain can go on. But whatever we do, if, we, if we're leaving the European Union, we know that that will have a short-term economic hit. I don't think anybody really disputes that. And therefore, what I want to see in the budget is the game plan for how we manage Britain, and particularly communities that we know will be affected by that, how we manage through this process. Because whatever happens on Brexit, Fundamentally, we will have this opportunity deficit, this this social mobility emergency. Uh, do you think we would you make a, a country... better job of negotiating Brexit than the Prime Minister? Would I do a better yes. job? <laughs> I've not been involved in the negotiations. No, right? I know. I would you like know to have been? Would you would you like to be leader of the Conservative Party? Because at the moment, it looks like there might be at some point a vacancy. Well, there isn't a vacancy. I'll tell you what, though, I am committed to doing whatever I can to make sure that this country, for the first time, is a place where it doesn't matter where you're growing up, you get the same opportunities. And I think we need to have the same level of ambition on that that governments in the past have had on creating the welfare state, setting up the NHS. We need a guarantee on opportunity for people in this country in the same way that we try to give them guarantees on health and guarantees on dignity if they are falling out of work. Sounds like a neat manifesto <laughs> for a leadership bid. Well, things need to change, don't they? And I think people need to have some hope for the future that Britain can be a country that runs differently and more fairly than it does at the moment. So you're saying if there's a vacancy, you may well put your case forward? I might be prepared to, but I'm more interested in the Conservative Party actually showing what it can do for this country. And I think, yes, we spend a lot of time having to fix the nation's finances, but what we now need to do is discover and re maybe rediscover our own mission, which has got to be about how we make sure that young people growing up everywhere in this country have the same access to opportunity. And it shouldn't matter, if you like, whether they've got parents who are maybe middle class, a bit more sharp elbowed. They, the talent is spread evenly. The challenge with Britain is that opportunity isn't, and that's what we've got to fix. I'd like to congratulate you, Justine Greening, for being probably the first politician <laughs> who's actually admitted they would like <laughs> to be leader of the Tory party, because normally people wriggle on a pin to get out of that question. And the fact that you're actually being fairly, fairly open about it, I think is something to be lauded. I didn't have a life mission to come into politics. I just want to see change on the ground. It is as simple as that. You campaigned for Remain. What would you do if you had to negotiate a Brexit, which was something that you didn't campaign for? I would try and get the best deal for our country, but I, I do think, crucially, we know clearly what the outcomes will mean in relation to the economy in the short term. And I think we owe it, A, to the British people to be honest about that and to be clear-cut about what we think those impacts will be, and then, B, to give them a very strong strategy for how we manage Britain through. And then, finally, to be clear-cut about what we're doing to maximise the opportunities that the freedom that Brexit will give can bring. My, my so you would, you would honour the referendum result that people voted to get out? Well, I mean, I've said that I think Parliament's gridlocked, Susanna, so I've said that when we get to that moment and the Prime Minister brings back her deal, I think Parliament will reject it. I think Parliament will reject every single possible route forward for Britain on the table. My proposal back in the summer was that we need to prepare for that. Parliament mm -hmm. shouldn't just amble into that moment and then be surprised that that's what's happened and therefore I think the only people who can actually pick that final route for us are the British people. I know that's not something anyone relishes, but A I'm second saying... referendum. That's where, yes, I'm saying that's where we are at and if that's where we're at, then we have to be successful in the real world, not some fake world that I don't think we're actually in. And if we had a second referendum, 
What would the question be? I, my proposal back in the summer was I think you've got to give people a choice of the three options, either a clean cut break that I know many leavers feel is not being delivered. I'm happy for the Prime Minister to put her deal to the people. If that's what they want, they should have it. I, don't th I think it's the worst of all worlds. Or, of course, they should be allowed to pick the status quo because, as ever, that is a real option facing Britain and so it shouldn't be off the ballot paper. People don't want it, they won't vote for it, so it doesn't matter. But the bottom line is we have to have a choice. People should have two votes, first and second choice, and then we should draw a line okay. under this and get on with it.